Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining on this sunny UK day, but also from wherever you are in the world. Uh, and for those coming back from last night, I uh, hope you enjoyed the double header. Um, so, wow, uh, amazing to have Sir Steve Redgrave on the show this morning. Uh, welcome, Sir Steve. Good, so, good I'm morning, thank you. Those in the UK. Yeah, so uh, actually, so I'll, I'll say Steve is, just to hold your breath for this one, Steve is joining us from quarantining in Wuhan. Uh, I'll, I'll explain a little why, but uh, that probably uh, is a pretty noteworthy thing to say. Uh, but in terms of uh, Steve and his background, Steve, as many people will know, probably everyone will know, is a, a five times Olympic gold medalist. Now, there are some people who have had more gold medals, but what's truly remarkable is that's across five separate Olympics, i.e. maintaining an unbelievable level of commitment and performance for 16 years, uh, which obviously famously included coming out of retirement after Atlanta in, I think it was 1996, for a final gold in Sydney. Uh, but before he did that, he famously said, if anyone sees me go near a boat, uh, you've got my permission to shoot me. So uh, clearly went back on that one, but I think for, with, with good effect. He's also won nine world championship medals, which doesn't get talked about much. Carried the flag at not one, but two Olympics. And I suppose more generally, you could say that Sir Steve is a high achiever. Uh, and that in, 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 in continued in his life after rowing. So um, actually an incredible achievement is in his third London Marathon in 2006, uh, Steve raised a record 1.8 million. I think that's still a record today. 2011 was voted BBC Sports Personality of the Year Lifetime Achievement Award, which is a biggie. He's launched businesses, rowing academies, received honorary doctorates and an MBE and a CB and a knighthood. So that Steve is someone who's got focus, determination, resilience, and actually this where it's a pretty unique opportunity to understand a bit more about what makes Steve tick. Um, Steve also lives in Marlow, which is my hometown, which is great. Um, so it's a real pleasure to have you on. And just the, the quarantine in Wuhan thing is obviously, um, Steve is now involved with Chinese rowing, the Chinese rowing uh, team, which we'll hear more about. And hence there is a logic to, as to why he would be quarantining in Wuhan. So very welcome to, and uh, uh, great to have you on the show, Steve. Thank you. It's good to join us um, with you this morning. So Steve, thank you again. And, and for myself, just such an absolute pleasure to have you on. Steve, um, I have to kick off where perhaps Mark just left off a second ago. Tell us why and, and what and how your current context. I'm the high performance director of Chinese rowing. Um, that uh, a role I, I took on. I was uh, offered the role and uh, I thought, no, I'm not interested. My life is busy enough as it is. Uh, I'm chairman at Henley Raw Regatta, uh, do quite a lot of motivational speeches, but um, I, I do miss the sport and the competing side. And so this job came up. I came over to Beijing for an interview, still thinking that uh, I probably wouldn't do it. And uh, about a month later, I, I signed my name on a piece of paper, taking me through to, to Paris. So another three years after this year. So uh, uh, it's quite a challenge, um, enjoying it. Um, that uh, very different to of the rowing that, uh, the, and the setup within the UK that I was used to. I brought in a whole series of, of other coaches from around the world. We've got a German coach that was coached in Germany, uh, formerly East German, uh, but living out in America. Uh, got an Irish coach that was coached in Canada, uh, US, uh, UK, as well as, uh, as Ireland, and an Australian coach that was coached in Australia and, and, and UK. So it's a whole sort of, uh, of, of uh, multi-international coaches. And uh, we're starting to improve the team. They've got uh, probably three chances of medals in Tokyo. The delay has helped us with one of them. Um, but we're reigning world champions in the, the other two. So uh, we're classed as favourites for the women's quadruple skull and the men's double skull. Uh, the women's quad... Um, is very, very good boat and, and firm favourites to, to win. We raced at World Cup 2 while I'm in quarantine. At the moment, we're in Switzerland uh, for the last two weeks doing the last World Qualifiers, which we qualified two more boats, and World Cup 2, which are qualified boats, which were six, uh, raced in that. So uh, the women won very comfortably. Uh, the men won, but very, very close. And the women's eight qualified really well, didn't race in World Cup two, but have put themselves in the frame of, of, of possibly uh, winning a medal um, in a couple of months time. So, so we'll, we'll get into the sort of the cultural fusion of a, a composite of Western coaches and, and Eastern athletes. But I actually want to go all the way back and just understand why and how you got started in rowing at all. 
Uh, good question. Um, why? Uh, I love sports. Um, when I was at school in, in the 70s, is that uh, of, of a comprehensive school, uh, any opportunity to get out of school or not go to school was at the top of my list. Um, but uh, because of being a sports lover and, and getting involved in, in uh, any activity we, we could, uh, my school was more of a football school than anything else. So I was the reserve goalkeeper for the football team. Uh, just because of my size, I could block uh, the goal quite well. Um, um, I got kicked off the team. Well, our team was, was OK. I got kicked off the team. They put me in goal for one match and the ball was down the far end most of the time. And uh, uh, in my boredom, I, I jumped up and hanged off the, the top of the, the, uh, the goalposts, which then snapped in my hands. Um, so it didn't put me in a, in a good stead with the sports uh, master there. Uh, but the head of the English department of that school had two loves. One was rugby and the other was rowing. And uh, he used to take a, an old boys um, group of rugby players uh, and uh, sort of uh, uh, do a few training sessions and the odd game. There wasn't too many. Um, but his main love was rowing and he started a small boat club attached to Marlow Rowing Club. He was captain of Marlow Rowing Club at the time. So it was the head of the English department that uh, came to a few individuals in our year group and said, would you like to try rowing? There was 12 of us that, that the, he asked. Uh, we all went down on the river um, in Marlow um, uh, on, the, on the Wednesday afternoon sports day. And uh, four of us, after a couple of weeks, stuck to it. So we ended up doing a Coxed Four, 1976. And uh, we entered seven events that year and won all seven. We thought we were the God's gift of rowing. What an easy sport this was. This was fantastic. But rowing generally has got an image of being private school. Um, so when you've got your Eatons, your Shrewsbury's, your Radleys that have a first eight, second eight, and sometimes a third eight, we were rowing in a four. So the best athletes from other schools were rowing in eight. So we didn't come across them for a couple of years. So uh, we were able to develop of, of winning races, which then sort of gave us the winning mentality. So when we did be able to race sort of our peers at the same sort of level is that when we raced, we won. So we had that attitude is that, uh, yes, this is a tough race. It's hard, but we'll do that a little bit extra to make sure we cross the line first. So Steve, that's, that, that's, that's a wonderful story. And, and particularly around never to underestimate the impact that teachers have in, in young people's lives. And, and I think it's too easy for us to forget the kind of impact that some of our previous teachers have had. So it's just amazing that that's where you started this journey. And of course, then being able to get to those lofty heights. I mean, did you, by the way, ever get back in touch with that English teacher and let him know? That, uh... Uh, yeah, he, he stayed part of my career right the way through. He lived in Marlow. Uh, unfortunately, he passed away a, a few years ago and I, I spoke at uh, uh, his uh, uh, funeral. Um, that uh, A great character um, that uh, did so much for bringing people into the sports was one of those people that could sort of pick talent out quite well and then nurture it to a certain level and then pass on to the next level. Um, somebody that uh, is heavily dyslexic and struggled, struggled at sport, uh, school, that sport was really sort of a, a release for me. So uh, Francis Smith, it was his name. He, he was uh, my form teacher for one year as well. Um, but uh, being the head of the English, he was in the top set of English where I was in the bottom set. So our paths didn't cross that many in the classroom, but uh, certainly uh, um, um, uh, of getting my career started. And his enthusiasm just rubbed on us, on, on us is that what we didn't realise at the time is that he just made it fun and enjoyable. So after our first year, we used to meet by his car um, after school and then he used to drive us down to the rowing club. We used to do our training session and then he would drive us and drop us off at our homes afterwards. And uh, it was just a, a routine and a process. Probably at that time in the 70s, most schools were rowing uh, three to six times a week uh, and we were rowing six to seven times a week um, and so that we were training as the best within the, in the country were the top schools um, and that able us to develop um, at our level as well as as I said earlier winning races it sort of uh, motivates you to to train harder 
um, and uh, of, of uh, want more success. You, you mentioned uh, dyslexia in school was a bit of a struggle. We had Will Greenwood a couple of weeks ago talking about the, the highs and lows of having uh, an autistic daughter. Um, there's a lot of dyslexia in my family. We talk uh, quite a bit about that on, on this show from time to time. Um, what, what challenges did that bring? But it also, do you think it gave you something different, a different approach and perspective? What, what role has dyslexia played in your success? Um, I, I suppose that, uh, that <clears throat> I, I struggled with self-confidence um, as somebody of, of six foot four, um, as a school kid, 15 stone plus, um, that uh, reasonably athletic, um, that there wasn't many people that, uh, that could pick on me from a physical point of view. Um, but uh, the, the being at the bottom of the class in, in most subjects is that uh, it doesn't do your demeanour much good. And uh, I suppose that I found sport reasonably uh, enjoyable and fun and, and was quite good at, at most things I put my hand to. Uh, rowing was the only one that I really excelled at, but I was a reasonable rugby player, uh, as I said, reserve goalkeeper in, in quite a good uh, school team. Um, discus, uh, shot put I could do, couldn't throw a javelin to save my life. And I was also a very fast sprinter. So uh, I, I was a school champion a number of times and represented the, the school in the districts and for the district championships as well. Um, so somebody of that size, I could move quite quickly for a short period of time as well, which was good for a sprinting within a boat, but rowing is more an endurance sport. So uh, I could always go off the start faster than, than most people and the best in the world. Um, but then I used to sort of have to have a bit of a holiday, write a few postcards in the middle of the race and then come back strong again at the end, which was able to compete quite highly within the UK. But when I came against my, my peers internationally in the single scale, which is one of the, the events I always wanted to do, is that uh, I always felt, felt a little bit short on that one. Uh, so, Steve, I want to pick up on something you said in the in the previous answer around uh, talent. And, and in fact, when you referred to your English teacher, you said Francis was his name. Um, you said that he was very good at taking kids from one level to the next and then sort of passing on to other people to do to then elevate them to the next bit. And that that then sort of says to me that you believe or, 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 or there is this perception of a cap to where you can go. And almost part of the trick is to know what you're very good at, where your sort of talent starts and ends, or where your, where your skill set starts and ends, and then, then know where to kind of move on to the next level. And I just wanted to question that because it feels a little bit like you've gone all the way to the top. And, um, you know, is, is there in your view then the, the thought that actually there is, you know, people should realize and understand that there are certain caps to their abilities in certain areas, and then know when to pass on, well, actually, is there no cap at all? And it's actually how you then devise to kind of get to that ne next level. I guess I'm asking, can you can we all get to a very high level in, in this in different areas? What do you think that we should know when to stop? I, I believe that uh, everybody is good at something. Um, and it's the problem of finding that, that thing that is your, uh, you've got the skill, the, the adaptation to of whatever it may be. Well, Francis had a very simple um, uh, uh, philosophy, and it was that uh, of these uh, big hands and and uh, uh, excuse my feet, big feet, um, is that uh, as a, a 13, 14 year old coming into secondary school, if you had big hands and big feet, you're likely to grow into a big person. And rowing is a leverage sport. Is that uh, this shows my education? It took me ten years to work this one out. I was always big and strong, um, but rowing is a leverage sport. Is that where the blade, the spoon of the blade goes into the water, you're not pulling that through the water. You're levering the boat past that position. So the taller you are, the further you can reach, uh, the further you're moving your boat per stroke. So if you think of a, a, a length of water, say the river, and it's got lots of little pegs along, you're reaching out and trying to slot in to the furthest one and then that fixes that, and then you're levering the boat past that position. Now, there's a bit of slippage, there is, is that. So the sport is, is for big people, um, tall people. 
even the lightweight division, they tend to be skinny and, and long levered. Uh, and the power is not that uh, uh, as, as important. Um, the power comes into it as open weight is that we can get our boats up to speed quicker. But when you're at cruise speed, uh, speed there isn't that much difference because your weight's being supported on the water anyway. Um, and again, it then comes down to the length of, of levers that you've got. As I said, it took 10 years of, of, of trying to work that one out. Uh, I always felt that I could power it through the water uh, quicker than anybody else. And this is what's going to do it, brute force and, and uh, ignorance in, in some ways. Um, and it's a lot more finesse than that. So I got a bit fed up when some smaller people started to beat me. So I had to change my technique to be able to uh, of, of get the best out of, uh, out of my level. Yeah, um, but very, very interesting that, uh, yeah, different insights there. I, I wanted to come talk a little bit about some of the obstacles you face, though, because you could look at your plot and think, oh, it's all being brilliant, five gold medals. Um, but, but of course, that won't be the case. And so we've talked to, about dyslexia. Also, I know you've, um, you're diabetic. So what, what have been some of the stumbles that we can all take inspiration from your resilience to push through? Uh, I suppose the first resilience comes into my first game as an, as a uh, should have been as an 18 year old. Uh, we qualified to go to the Moscow Olympics. I was in a, uh, a quadruple skull in that year. I was still a junior that year and we'd made all the qualifications and uh, those that are old enough will remember the boycott of the, the uh, Americans, West Germans, uh, the Kiwis. Uh, over the Russians going into uh, be the Soviet Union in those days, going into Afghanistan. Um, and uh, so there was a, a boycott, which then reduced the funding for the games. Um, quite a lot of the, the Brits um, funding comes from American uh, corporates. So they had all withdrew. So there wasn't the, the, the cash flow um, as there would be for a normal Olympics. So we sent a smaller team. And uh, I was below the cut line, even though that we made the selection. So that was my first disappointment. And I was bitterly disappointed over that because I don't think sport and politics should mix. It does. And uh, of, of rightly so in some cases. But it should be standing shoulder to shoulder uh, with business, industry, uh, sport and government. And that's not always the case. And that wasn't the case in, in eighty eight. Uh, for an example, the, the Americans uh, didn't send their, their Olympic team. Very amateur in those days. There wasn't any professionalism um, at all in, in, in that era. Um, so people had sacrificed their lives to train and prepare. And then the government came out and said, you're not going. Um, but uh, the Soviet Union had gone through three years of, of bad crop uh, uh, production. And the Americans were selling shiploads of grain to the Soviets at the same time, um, which, is, which is crazy. If you're making a political statement, stand up uh, business and sports and governments together and, and make a difference. And if you relate that to apartheid, very similar. Apartheid went on for 30-odd uh, years. And it wasn't until financial sanctions that came in. And it changed very, very quickly, within months, um, certainly not years, and uh, that uh, we, we, the countries still traded with South Africa of diamonds, gold, uh, the British Airways would be flying in. Uh, and then suddenly the, they took a stronger stance and everyone stood together, not just using columns of, of, uh, of newspapers and newsreel on, on amateur sports people uh, of, of trying to get coverage in a different way. Now, I'm all one for standing up with everybody else, but don't pick out one group from the other. Let's do it all together. If, this, if it's right to try and break that regime of, of whatever may be happening. There's a little bit of a politics for you. Sorry about that. All right. Good, good perspective. Now I forgot what the original question was. Let me, let, let me, let me take it in a, in a slightly different direction. Um, in the sense that you, you said when you were younger, one of the key things that you believed added to your ability to win and succeed was the thought that actually early on you were quite successful because you weren't playing with the big boys. Um, and so to that gave you that sort of sense of belief. And in fact, I was watching a video just prior to this interview and you actually said that you could, you could actually see your name on the trophy. Um, and it wasn't really a case of, it wasn't a case of if, it was always a case of when. 
Um, and I just want to get to a two part question. Um, the first is, um, what role do you think that positive affirmation and belief actually played in your ability to actually create the when? And the second one is, what do you think would have been the case had you not been able to achieve what you have? How would you have been able to have dealt with that? Um, particularly my analogy simply is, you know, for every Richard Branson in the world, there's probably 10,000 people who thought they could be and didn't make it. And so I just wanted to get your thoughts on, on the polar opposites of belief and, and, and the role it's played. But also, how do you think you'd have coped if, if you were one of those 10,000 and not the Richard Branson of your, of your space? I think you've got to have belief. If you don't have belief, you're not going to get the best out of your, your ability. But then again, if you're trying to be the world's best at whatever, uh, you've got to have uh, a certain amount of talent and, and uh, aptitude to be able to do that. And uh, as I, I started racing as a, as a 14 year old at, at school level, um, by the time I was 15, 16, I'd, uh, that uh, some of the coaches at my, my rowing club, even though I was attached to the school, is that saying, oh, you could be a world champion. And I thought, oh, that sounds quite nice. And that sort of gave me a focus in some ways. But I thought, why, why a world champion? I, I want to be Olympic champion. So I, I can safely say at probably the age of 16, I targeted that I would probably go to three Olympics, uh, 80, 84 and 88. And 88 was the one that I was going to win. So I had that sort of inner belief. Now, in that era, in rowing uh, in the UK, we were not very good. Um, we would pick up the odd medal at uh, World Championships um, um, and certainly not be pushing for, for gold medals. And we hadn't won a gold medal um, in rowing since 1948, uh, the games after the Second World War, where the, the uh, uh, competition wasn't as, 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 de uh, as deep as it was, even though London staged those games. London only won three gold medals in total. Um, the 50k walk, and uh, the Coxes pairs um, uh, and the double skulls within rowing up at Henley. Uh, Hugh Laurie's dad was in the in the pair that won. Uh, just a bit of useless information that I'll, I'll stick in there as well. Um, and uh, the, so there wasn't a lot of history to, to follow on. So really, 84 winning our first gold medal, that we were trying to break the history of recent history of where we've been. We, we, we started the sport of competitive side of it, uh, dominated it in the early years of, of the Olympics. And then what Brits have, have used to be really good at is bringing the sport to everybody and then everyone does it better than us. And then we have to go and invent something else that we can be uh, the best at until that people take it over. That has changed slightly, but a uh, bit tongue in cheek, but there is an element of truth within that. And so you've got to have that belief. So I had that belief from somewhere. I wasn't really following any, so anybody. So it was really sort of breaking down the mold of where we got, where we were internationally. And uh, my coach at that time was another guy from Marlow, a guy called Mike Spracklin. And uh, he was a lightweight before there was lightweight rowing. So uh, he had to be technically better than anybody else. He had to train harder than anybody else just to compete at being a smaller size against the, uh, the, the bigger body shapes uh, and was very successful from that point of view. Um, and so you have to have that ability, but ability is only part of it, is that uh, you've got to have the belief, you've got to have the dedication. And I think that I actually told the story uh, on a podcast yesterday that I did, is that there was an Ameri a, a, a French journalist that did an interview on me just before the build up to the Sydney games, three years before the Sydney games. And I'd won uh, four Olympic gold medals. Um, I don't know how many world championships at, at, that, at that time, uh, probably seven or eight. And uh, that uh, of one of the best rowers that has, has been involved in, in the sport. And he sort of picked subjects and areas within the sport of endurance, technique, of attitude, of uh, resilience and all these elements and marked them out of 10. And I didn't get a 10 in any of them, which at the time I was absolutely devastated. How, what an insult of somebody that's one of the best um, uh, is not a 10 in anything. Um, and then what he'd done is that then he'd added up the total and it was the end score. And what happened is that my end score was higher than anybody else that he'd ranked 
in lots of different sports. Um, and so I can actually relate that. And he was probably right. Is I'm a, I'm a good technician, but not the best. I'm, I'm big and strong, but I'm not the biggest or the strongest. Um, and so I was eights and nines in almost every category and didn't really have a, a, an overall weak category. And that gave me the overall score. And then that also shows you that, that people can go faster. They can be better because I wasn't the perfect specimen. I wasn't of, of the seven categories that he chose. Um, I didn't head any of them. So somebody could come in and head all of them and obviously potentially be, be better. So there's, a, there's lots of aspects to that. And I, I suppose where I found is that some, sometimes you, you see people, especially in sports, um, is that if, it, if it's too easy for them, there isn't the challenge and you need that challenge. Now, I was good at rowing, but I wasn't the best. And I had to work harder to get the best out of myself. And so when you sort of did more training, more preparation, and then you start getting the results, you think, OK, that's the key to unlocking success. And so if I do even more and become even more dedicated, uh, I can even get more consistent and, and, and better within the sport. And so you latch on to something that gives you a positive and then work at it. But then at certain times, a career of 25 years, you have to reinvent yourself over five Olympics. You can't just do the same things over and over again. Uh, you can look at the marginal gains and improve that, but sometimes you have to look at things laterally and make a bigger leap. And sometimes that can make you go slower and be worse for it. But if you don't take that, then you might not be able to get the next step of your, your the, the level that you want to get to uh, moving up that ladder some lovely insights there steve so the you know got to have the belief don't have to be a 10 on on anything but consistency which is very much a message from yesterday's show consistency makes the day and then also you talked a bit about experimentation it won't always be perfect but um i just wanted to understand about you know how you maintained that level of commitment for so long and then there was obviously the moment about you know shoot me if i get in a boat again I mean, that's such a long period of time. You must get boredom, frustration, injuries. Set, you know, ha, what is it in you that made you go for 16 years? That was 16 from, from racing the first one to racing the last one. There was a little a, a little eight-year build-up to the first one as well. So there was another, a little bit more time in that. You don't just turn up and say, oh, I fancy doing the Olympics today. Oh, I've, I've won. Oh, I'll keep going for the next 16 years. So there was a little bit of preparation before, before the first one. I suppose that from, from the, the attitude and the, the assets that I had, is that where people could say that you were potentially uh, of, of uh, could be a potential world champion. And then I set my targets higher. And what Richie said earlier is about the trophy, is that I felt my name was engraved on it, but I didn't know what year. If I followed what the coaches were telling me, um, I would then sort of build up. Um, and year after year, I got a little bit better. And that happened for three or four years. And then I, I took a nosedive and, and at the World Championships got eliminated, didn't make the top 12. And that was really the turning point for me because the, instead of expecting it to happen, and when you've got a reasonable amount of talent, and I was very dominant in the sport in the UK and on the par with people internationally, and then suddenly you're not winning races that you should be competitive in. You ask questions, why? Perhaps I'm not that good. Perhaps I'm, uh, I'm not that. But I had that inner belief. Other people had that inner belief. And that was the turning point because when I got eliminated and had to sit on the bank and watching everyone else race for the, for the next uh, four days leading up to the finals and watching people getting medals and thinking, God, what am I doing here? That's where I re-evaluated. Re and I realised that uh, my ma name may be in engraved on it, uh, but I have to make it happen. It's not just going to bide your time. Tick this box, this box, and this box, and you'll achieve this. You have to tick those boxes. You have to go through the process of doing the volume and the process, the, the mental preparation, as well as the physical preparation to it all. But uh, you, you've also got to make sure that you've got that hunger and that desire. So where I felt it was going to come easy to me is that that's where I talked about earlier of, of making it happen. And so that, uh, and it was, it was quite a turnaround. So that, that year was 83. 
um, and 10 months later, I was Olympic champion. Um, that was quite a dramatic of not being in the top 12 to being the best in the world and having a world record uh, under my belt at, at the same time. Um, um, and so that uh, you, you have to be of, 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 of take the, 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 the nettle the grasp of your hand is that you may have some good coaches around you. You may have a good setup. I felt I had one of the best coaches. He's proven himself in many countries that he is one of the best countries uh, coaches in, in the world. Um, but that isn't enough. You still need the, the, the talent to push themselves to their limits and beyond to get the best out of them and then produce it on the day with all the pressure and the tension that's, that, that, that's there as well. Um, there's lots of assets. So at the beginning of my career, um, I can probably name most of the, the gold medalists that, that Britain had uh, from 76 through to uh, of, of 92. Um, we won a maximum of, of four gold medals at, uh, uh, sorry, a maximum of five gold medals at uh, most of those games. One we, we had four at um, and they were household names. And suddenly in 84, I was one of these, what I thought was a household name. And it wasn't quite like that. Uh, rowing was a part of the pun about water sport. Uh, didn't really get the coverage from it. I can remember somebody's talking to me uh, at a function that I was at. And they said, oh, what do you do? And I said, well, I, I row. And they said, oh, who do you row for? Oxford or Cambridge? And I said, well, I, I, I row at Olympic level. Oh, well, that, 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 that's good. What level did you get to? I said, oh, I've got Olympic gold medal. Oh, that must have been really hard training the last two months into that. Now, actually, the last two months is the easy bit. It's the eight years before that to get to that level is the, is the hard bit. Uh, and then as the, the sort of, of winning gold medal after, after each games is that that recognition, not that I was after the recognition at all, but people realised of what commitment Olympic athletes put into their sport, as is amateurs. Um, uh, uh, that uh, One of my friends, I haven't seen him for a very long time, Joe Lydon, was a, a rugby league player. And uh, he was the young player of the year in 84 and our paths crossed. And he couldn't believe it as, 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 uh, as a rugby league player, a professional rugby player, we were training more than he was as a professional sportsman. Uh, and we weren't getting paid for it and, and had to hold down part-time or full-time jobs to be able to survive. Now that has changed because of lottery grants for Olympic athletes and, and, and so forth uh, is that our Olympic teams are, are near enough professional in their, their, their structure now. And there is some sort of financial uh, support to that where sort of pre nineties uh, there wasn't. Um, and it, it became, it was really quite tough of being able to, to find that. And actually when the lottery funding came in and more funding came in, I was a bit set. Uh, I wasn't sure, quite sure if it would make a huge difference because we had good sportsmen going, winning medals, but not gold medals. And I didn't think the finance would turn those medals into gold medals. Um, um, that uh, I, I thought, actually, because of our nature of structuring sports, is people that are good at sports find themselves in a sport where they might not be the best suited for. So a little bit of the question going back to before, you can get to a certain level uh, on commitment and, and, and ability, but if you don't have the physical makeup for that discipline, you, it's going to be really difficult to, to break down those, those barriers. But I was wrong. So from Atlanta, when we uh, uh, did really badly, that uh, the British team only won one gold medal uh, for the whole games, um, that uh, we, we turned it around with the lottery funding that came in and we got 11 in, in Sydney. Um, and then since then, we've moved on higher and higher. It'll be interesting to see how, how Britain does in, in Tokyo. There's, there's quite a lot of, of structural changes about competitive sport and how it should be focused on. And it should it be as intense as it is. If you want to be the best in the world, anything, uh, business, industry, sport, you have to push the boundaries back uh, physically and mentally to be able to, to, to get to that sort of level. Um, and that what people want is a, a couple of little nuggets that they can improve on. But in fact, there's lots of little things that you have to put in place. And I know you've had Clive Goodwood on before, and I know Clive extremely well, and he, he talks brilliantly about uh, uh, of, of thinking out of the box. 
Um, and you have to do that. You have to look at things in a totally different way. There is no book written of how people have won their gold medal at the Tokyo Olympics through the pandemic, through the delay of a year, um, that people are finding their own pathway. We know that they've got to be better than, than they were five years ago at Rio uh, because the level keeps on going up. And so you've got to break down those barriers to get to that, that top and you've got to look at every aspect to, to how to be able to achieve that and do that. So, Steve, you know, one of the things that I've, I've certainly taken away is, the, is your, your story just at the beginning where you talked about the, you know, the failure that then led to the ultimate success. And that, and that sort of period of time was, you know, relatively short, nine, ten months between those two moments. And it just, it just says to me how close so many of us are to the line between success and failure all the time. And I guess it comes down to, as you put it, like the little things, pushing the boundaries, belief mindset which tips it over the balance from one side to the next um and, and you know it's just it's just a fascinating sort of mental mindset to try and get ourselves into um you know you've also said that you know you certainly were a household name and one of the most high profile british athletes around now i suspect as you talked about you didn't get the coverage and in many ways that is a blessing and a curse and I just want to get your take on athletes of today who have to deal with the raft of social media, always being in the spotlight, constantly almost clued in to their phones, checking out the public perception. Do you think that actually has a bearing, positive or negative? Um, and do you actually feel positive or, 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 or um, sort of negative or happy or, 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 you know, sorry for some of these athletes today who have to bear the brunt? of social media barrages sometimes? I, I would have hated social media, uh, as, I, as I do. Um, uh, it, it plays a part, but it's very much in the youth's li lives. It's part of, of what's out there. Um, that uh, of, of uh, the, the bits of technology that we had in our boat was the state of the art at the time. Um, but that's moved on and things move on and you have to move with the times. And of being a great athlete, especially in the Western world, is that you've got to be better than just a good athlete, is that you have to deal with all these issues. When I was talking about the funding problems within uh, the early part of my career, almost to, to the end of my career, is that, uh, the, that you have to be a financial manager, you have to manage your time, you, you have to find your own sponsors. Uh, and it's not sponsors that are giving you money because they want to give you money is that it, it's give and take is that they're, they're, they're getting something from you and vice versa. And so it's a partnership from that point of view. So you have to have so many more skill levels uh, back in the seventies, uh, the sixties, seventies and eighties and, and um, East Germany were the best rowing nation. And uh, all their rowers had to think about was rowing. Um, they had professional coaches. It's still the only country that has put, huge resources into coaches and developing coaches because no government will pump money into coaching when a coach will finish their course, uh, do their apprenticeship or whatever it may be, and then go to the highest bidder around the world. Why the British government produce coaches for other countries, they wouldn't do that because East Germany was a closed environment, is that it was all self-contained. And so they saw coaching as a big step forward. Now that's an area where sport can move on in a big time in every sport, I believe. Um, but the, the, we have to look at it in a different way if that's what we want to do. Um, and, and so that uh, you've, you've got to of, 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 of have these processes to get the best out of yourself and, and the, the whole process within that. And as I say multiple times, there's lots of different things that you have to put in place. And then you've got to race well on the day. So um, the time is it by. Uh, and so probably last, last question. Um, you're, you're probably our most famous Olympian. What you've achieved is absolutely incredible. You can still, you still, still see, you know, you're quarantining in Wuhan. You've still got the drive and determination. Sorry, Lucy, I didn't get a chance to answer your question, but maybe it will fold into this in terms of, you know, what keeps you going. But actually, you know, th this goes out to, a wide range of a wide range of audience, but the school of marketing is to help people to get into marketing and thrive. 
particularly from people from difficult circumstances and backgrounds. So from all your years of experience and success, what, what advice would you give to young people today who are trying to figure out what to do with their lives? It's really difficult. And people find it at different ages. Some people don't find it ever. Um, and uh, I think it's really difficult. The, uh, I'm the youngest of three. I've got two elder sisters, um, come from a working class background. Uh, my grandfather worked on the trams and buses in, in, in Birmingham. So uh, I, I come from a, a very sort of, of, uh, of grassroots level from a sport that is seen to be uh, of uh, highly educated and affluent within that. And, and it was a struggle. But being youngest, my eldest sister is nine years older than me. So there's quite a big age group. And my parents' views had, had changed over that period of time. So uh, we're all reasonably good at, uh, at, at sport. My eldest sister was, was, was quite a good runner, but never had the opportunity. My next sister down that's five years older than me was a very good swimmer. Uh, but again, the opportunities weren't there for her to do. And then she uh, um, uh, sort of uh, found boys and partying and, and uh, so uh, that uh, went off in a different uh, direction. They were both married at the age of 19 uh, and their lives really changed. And I suppose because of my success at a young age, my parents wanted to help me to get the best out of whatever I had. Um, and so they supported me as, as much as, uh, as they could. But I think you've got to have that love for it as well. I did go through, uh, after winning my first Olympic gold medal, uh, struggling with, uh, I had a back injury and things weren't going the way that I, I thought they should be after being an Olympic champion. Um, I nearly gave up the sport. And I remember going to my parents and uh, sort of to tell them that I was going to give up the sport and uh, expecting to be physically uh, beaten around the ear by my mother and saying, you, you're stupid, you're brilliant at this, why don't you keep going uh, of that? And I didn't get that response at all. It was that, uh, well, we, we think you're, you're, you're crazy, um, that uh, we think you've got a lot further you can go within, within this, the sport and, and, and where you are at the moment. But if that's your decision, we support you. Chin hit the ground, uh, wasn't expecting that at all. And that made me reevaluate in some ways. I felt I was doing it for them. It got to the stage that I lost the enjoyment of it and I was doing it for other people. And then when they sort of took that step back, I thought, well, actually, hmm. I went off and did some bobsleighing. I made the British bobsleigh team and, and did a few uh, bits and pieces, still doing a bit of, uh, of rowing training. And it was while I was away at bobsleighing that we finished uh, ninth at uh, a World Cup race. And I'm thinking, what are you doing? Um, you're one of the best within your sport. I took a rowing machine to Sarajevo with the course that we were competing at that and was doing some training in, in, in the, the foyer of the hotel while still competing at bobsleigh. And that was the weekend I thought, right, yeah, let's go back and let, let, let's see how far you can take this. You always said you were going to go to three Olympics. Let's, let's see if we can uh, uh, get to the next step. And that was the sort of uh, the refocusing and, and doing it for the love of it. So the simple answer is you've got to enjoy what you're doing. Um, you don't have to enjoy it every day of every second of every moment of that. But if it goes over 50% uh, negative, then start thinking about doing something else. There's got to be something out there that motivates you, interests you. You may not be the best in the world at it, but if you get pleasure out of doing it for whatever reason, uh, live your dream. Don't get caught in the rat race and, and uh, doing stuff just for the sake of doing it. That, that's, that's fab. Thank you. Um, you know what, what the saying that I think you've just busted in my, in my head is often people say, you know, reach for the stars and hit the moon. In fact, you reach for the moon and hit the stars. Quite incredible in many ways. Three Olympics into then five. So you kind of really succeeded and, and over... Um, estimated uh, what you were going to do. So it was just fab. Thank you, Steve. Well, the, 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 reality of, the reality of that is that uh, I, I thought I'd go to three games, win one, um, but I never really wanted to do a proper job. So uh, of playing at sport uh, was the easy way out. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, Steve, unfortunately, we really are out of time. Um, but what, what we always do at the end of, of a show 
is just to summarize some of the key points that have resonated with, with both of us. So let me just do a couple and then I'll pass over to Mark to, to finish and close. Um, you, you started off by really talking about the fact that everybody is good at something. And actually, perhaps what's probably one of the most important takeaways for me is to make sure that we do go about life and find that thing that we are really good at. Because clearly, once you get there, you can then achieve some pretty lofty heights. And um, that doesn't then come without dedication. And I think that, you know, to some extent, there is, particularly in, in, in areas like sports, there is uh, some physical barriers and boundaries that we all have to consider. But actually, it's that dedication. And in fact, you even said that there was a time when people smaller than you were actually beating you because actually your technique wasn't as good. Um, and you thought brute force was the way that you could push and power through when actually technique and finesse, as you called it, you know, push through the water was actually the thing that, that you know, was, was more powerful than the brute force, which I thought was really interesting. Um, you mentioned the fact that actually you don't need to be a 10 at anything. Um, actually, it's the end score that actually is probably the most important thing. It's the sum of all the parts that then build up to create the magic. Um, belief played a massive role in your um, and, and where you were able to achieve, although clearly self-doubt also played a part, which you were able to overcome in many ways. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll stop there and, and hand over to Mark for some of his key takeaways. But just from me, so, so Steve, thank you so much for your time. It's been an absolute joy and pleasure. Pleasure. Thanks, Richie. Thanks, Richie. You caught a lot of the, a lot of the points I was going to mention, but just to add a few, I guess thank you to, to your English teacher. Um, I'm sure he was always very, very proud of you. Um, it was only 10 years in that you realised it was about leverage, you know, so even you can be the best in the world and realise that there's something important still to be discovered. Um, you've got to get the best out of yourself. You have to push the boundaries if you want to be the best in the world. Know what you're good at. Lots of lessons there, messages there around being tuned in to what it is you're there to do and, and how to be the best at it. But I'm, I'm going to take away that, you know, you have to enjoy it. You have to love it. And your loss of love for your sport the re-realisation of what, why you were doing it and you were doing it for yourself and your own pleasure and you were living your dream, not your parents' dream. That's a really powerful message. And we, you know, we need to be clear on why we're doing what we're doing for ourselves and, um, and love what we do. Uh, so thank you so much for coming on the show, Steve. It's been a real pleasure. Um, can't thank you enough on behalf of myself and Richie and everybody tuning in. Thank you. Yeah, real pleasure. Just, uh, just as we close, next week, 8 a.m. UK time as ever. We've got Vicky Gosling, OBMBE, lots of other letters after a name as well, um, it, it turns out. Uh, Vicky's CEO of GB Snowsport. Uh, she's also CEO of the Invictus Games in a, in a previous uh, life and had a, a glittering career in the military. So it's going to be the first time we'll talk about somebody who's traversed from military to uh, business and being a CEO. So there should be lots of lessons learned there. So for, for now, have a fantastic weekend and hopefully see you next Friday. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.